Hey, good morning, ACC. Yeah, I'm so glad to see all of you here, especially if you are a first time, maybe second time visitor here. I want you to know that one thing that's really unique about Arundel Christian Church that we've been focusing on these past few months is we think there's a very big difference between a, a visitor and a guest. And let me tell you the difference. A visitor to your house kind of just shows up uh, without an invitation. A guest you are expecting. A guest is there by, by invitation. And I want you to know if you are checking us out for the first time, we consider you a guest here. We were expecting you. We're so glad you're here checking out Arundel Christian Church. My name is Matt. I serve here at ACC on the pastoral staff, um, and it's one of the cool things I get to do as part of my job. Most Sundays, I get to hang out up here for a little while and uh, teach out of God's Word. So before I do that this morning, would you uh, do me a favor? Let's bow and ask God to, to bless this time of teaching. Uh, Father, I ask that you, would, that you would work this morning. God, ultimately, as we open up your word, we know that it never returns void. And as we're studying the book of Colossians together, I pray that you would speak truth into our lives out of what Paul was saying to the church in Colossae in this letter. God, as we're, as we're gleaning and, and reading, I pray that you would show us something very specific that we need to do in our lives to put you in the director's chair, calling the shots. We love you, and we thank you, and we give you this time. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Have you ever experienced, uh, let, me, let me talk just to those in this room for a moment who have professed the name of Christ at one point. So you, you consider yourself a Christian, you're a Christ follower. In other words, the old is gone and the new has come. Those of you in this room, have you ever, uh, I know you have, how, how annoying is it in our life when we, we claim to be following uh, and living a new life in Christ and yet we continue to do things related to our old nature? Anyone else with me on that? It's frustrating, right? We, we go back a time and time again and we do things that are outside of our new identity in Christ. And, and let me tell you why we do that. Do you know who was sitting in the director's chair of your life before you gave your life to Christ? You were. You were sitting in the chair calling the shots on your own life. You were deciding what you were going to do and how you were going to act and how you were going to treat people and all the things that were happening in your life. You were the one in charge. And now... Believer, those of you who have given up that seat and you've decided to make Jesus the Lord of your life, it's really, really hard to give up our chair, isn't it? We like to do things our own way. We like to call the shots in our own life. And today we're going to look at Colossians chapter 3. We're going to look at this, this idea of getting ourselves out of the seat and putting the real the director Remember in Colossians chapter 1, the supremacy of Christ. We're going to put the director, Christ himself, in the seat where he belongs. You know, we um, oftentimes don't act the way we ought to. We don't think things the way we should. We, we say things, and we, as soon as we say them, we wish we could take them back. And I wanted to show you, I've been promising you for the last couple weeks, a clip does anyone else uh, remember this, or can we pass it? Can we skip it? All right. Um, all right. Well, since you were, I guess you heard that promise, I have to fulfill it. But let me tell you, let me set this up for a moment. In what you're about to see, I play the part of a little boy who has this new disease called ALD. And in this disease, his body is starting to not work and operate the way it's supposed to. Just like when you've given your life to Christ, oftentimes you find yourself doing things and saying things that you wish you wouldn't and trying to figure out why uh, who you want to be and who you are isn't lining up. So uh, I'm going to show you this one-minute clip. It's all you're going to get to watch. Uh, check it out. Thank you. 
all you're going to get. Uh, <laughs> in all seriousness, if the, the, it's a true story. Uh, the American version of that movie is called Lorenzo's Oil. It's about two parents who quit their jobs to cure an uncured disease for their son. It's amazing how they were able to solve what all, all these scientists and doctors weren't able to do. But here, at the end of the day, uh, it, it's amazing to me how even in this story, you have a boy who, who things just aren't, you know, time and time again, he's, he's wondering, like, why are all these things happening? Why is my body, why, are, why is my mind, why are my eyes not working the way I want them to? I really wish it would stop. And we, as followers of Christ in this room, those of you who have professed the name of Christ, you ought to be processing that same thing anytime you act outside of your new nature, it ought to make you wonder and pause, like, why, why do I keep doing that? Why do I so often act outside of my nature? And there's, this, there's a word I want to teach us this morning. I want to talk through this word. It's a, it's a Bible word. It's a word that you're only going to hear in church. Maybe you've heard it before, but it's this thing called sanctification. You guys, how about you say that with me? You ready? One, two, three. Sanctification. Here's what sanctification is. There's, there's where you are right now, and there's where God is. And the idea, the process of sanctification is becoming more like Christ. So ultimately, there's this gap that we're all kind of experiencing. There's, who, there's our identity in Christ, and there's the way we actually act. And there's this gap in between, and the process of closing that gap is called sanctification. It's the process you go through to become more and more like Christ. In other words, it's this often, it's this constant thing, this constant reminder that we need to get out of the chair and we need to put Christ in the chair. And every day you're gonna find yourself squeezing yourself back into that chair. But the process of sanctification is when you recognize you're calling shots in your life again, is to get out. Because as you're closing this gap, Going through this process of sanctification, you're going to find that that's where you find your true identity and true joy. So let me talk through six reasons that I think you should embrace sanctification in your life. If you have decided to follow Christ, you need to be embracing the process of being more like Christ. So here's six reasons from Colossians chapter 3 that we ought to go through this process. Colossians, or the first one is this. We need to follow Jesus because of what he's done for you. I need to follow Jesus because, what of, because of what he's done for me. In fact, we see this in Colossians 3, verse 1. It says, since you have been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven where Christ is seated in the place of honor at God's right hand. You see that very first word I underline there for you is the word since. In other words, because of the gospel, because of the truth that Jesus, that God sent his son Jesus to this earth, that he lived a perfect life that you couldn't live, and that he died on the cross in your place, the death you deserve to die, and then was buried and on the third day rose again and conquered death. Because of that incredible truth, what we call the good news, because of that, you ought to embrace the process of becoming more like the God who did that for you. Does that make sense? Because of the gospel, you should be getting out of the seat and letting Christ call the shots in your life. He saved your life. A second reason is we ought to follow Jesus because the old plan doesn't work. Can I get an amen on that? Amen, all right? Listen, the, the old plan, the way we used to do things, even if you're in this room right now and you, would not have, you have not experienced salvation in Christ, you, you're still exploring your faith, listen, we, that's one thing we can all agree on in this room is that when you try to allow the world to fulfill you, you are going to be a constant consumer because you are never, ever, ever gonna be satisfied in this world. 
You're going to seek things to try to find purpose and meaning. You're going you're to be grabbing and taking anything that the world has to offer, trying to come up with purpose and meaning in your life. And everyone in this room, I think that's one thing we can all agree on. You will not be satisfied. You will always need more. We see this in Colossians chapter 3, verses 2 to 3. It says, think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. For you died to this life and your real life is now hidden with Christ in God. In other words, you, you died. Hey, listen, believer, you, you have died to the old life. This, this thing over here, we have this baptistry. It's filled with water. If you aren't familiar with the church and the Christian church and the way we do things in the church, listen, I fully recognize that a lot of what we do in the church to an outsider looking in is a bit weird. We do some weird things, don't we? From the outside looking in, like once you understand the purpose and the meaning behind some of the things we do, that they become very, very special and the, it's such an incredible truth. And this, this baptistry is one of the things that from the outside looking in is, is a weird, wait, so you get up and you go like in this thing and you like, somebody pushes you under the water and you come, what's that about, Matt? Let me tell you about it. You see, when you go into that water, it symbolizes you walk in as the old you. This is my old Matt Osdall, right? I'm standing here. This is symbolizing me before in my old life. And then when you're pushed down into the water, it represents death. Just like when you're buried underground, you are buried, you're dead, your body goes under the water. It symbolizes the fact that the old you is gone. And then the best part, you come back up out of the water, resurrected to new life. And what this verse is telling us is, listen, you, listen, the, the old you is gone. You, you've died to this life. The life that you had before, it's, it, you're dead to that now. So don't think about the, the old life. Don't think about the things of earth. Instead, think about the things of heaven. And the way that the, the things of heaven are described here, it says, this is your real life. In other words, that life that you lived before Christ, there was nothing real about it. It was fake. There was no, nothing good there for you. You have a real life, a new life. And the old life needs to be cut off and gone. C.S. Lewis says, if we find ourselves with a desire that nothing in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that we were made for another world. Here, here's what this verse ultimately means, church. When you go out into this world and you try to find fulfillment in the things of this world, you try to find fulfillment through, through you know, the bar or through, through consuming uh, sex or through consuming uh, taking things and consumerism. and just If you just go out in this world and you try to take and try to find some sort of fulfillment for yourself, you are never going to be fully fulfilled. And that ought to be a sign to you that what you've been experiencing, you know, what you experienced before Christ, your old life, the life you have died to, it wasn't, it wasn't fulfilling anything for you. There was no truth. There was no good in it. And that leads us to a third reason. If the old life wasn't good, Number three, we ought to follow Jesus because he's better than the old life. He's better than this world. We, we ought to, if we're not going to follow uh, uh, the world because it's not good, now we ought to figure out who are we going to follow. And the Bible is clear that we ought to follow Christ. Colossians 3, verses 4 through 5, it says, is when, And when Christ, who is your life, is revealed to the whole world, you will share in all his glory. So put to death the sinful earthly things lurking within you. Have nothing to do with sexual immorality, impurity, lusts, and evil desires. See, there's, there's a word that I underlined. That when, when your life in Christ is, when, when Christ is revealed to the whole world. You know, in Philippians 2, it says that there will be a moment in time that every knee will bow. And every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. 
There will be a moment in time that every single person, living or dead, will acknowledge that Christ is Lord. And when that is revealed, according to the scripture, when that is made known to the whole world, the Bible says that you will be able to share in that glory. In other words, following Christ is far better than following the world. And my favorite part about this verse is this this word, so put to death. The way the NLT writes this verse, the New Living Translation, the Bible that you might have read from, it says to put to death uh, as if you're taking the action of actually like, here's your old life and you're actually like killing it. But there's a better uh, way to translate this verse. And when you see how this, this Greek word is used other places in Scripture, I think a better translation into English would be uh, consider it dead. Let me explain what consider it dead means. When, when I was in high school, I, I, I loved amusement parks. I still love amusement parks. I'm a roller coaster junkie. I enjoy going and spending the day at amusement parks. And I had a favorite shirt. It was my amusement park shirt. If I was going to an amusement park, I put on that shirt. It was from a band I saw when I was in high school called Everybody Duck. And I put the shirt on and I'd go to the amusement park. Now, there's a problem with this shirt. So over time, somehow it's gotten a lot smaller. <laughs> Maybe. Now, listen. No, for real. This shirt is a size medium. When I go to an amusement park nowadays, I don't wear this shirt for your sake. Okay? No one is ever going to see me in this shirt again anytime soon. So this shirt, for all intents and purposes, I still own it. It's still in a drawer in my house. It's still a shirt that has a lot of cool memories associated with it. But as far as I am concerned, that shirt is as good as trash to me. I might as well take it to goodwill. I'm not going to be able to wear it again. It doesn't actually serve me any purpose. It's just taking up space in my closet. The same way, listen, the old life that you used to live You don't need, uh, the Bible isn't saying that you you literally have to be killing it. It has already been cut off. It has already been removed. It's not a part of you anymore. Although, remember, we talked a couple weeks ago how we we carry it with us. We take our old nature, even though it's been cut off, we we stay attached to it. We walk around, and, and sometimes we struggle to let go of who we used to be. The Bible says, listen, that old nature, that shirt, Matt, that is as good as trash. It is as good as dead to you. There is no value in it anymore. There's nothing good that can come from the world. There's no reason to hang on to parts of it thinking that one day this might again serve a purpose. Listen, the world, the old you, consider it dead. The problem is it's still, the world is still very much alive. There is still sin and brokenness everywhere we look. And the Bible isn't saying, listen, go out and kill it. It's saying that it's, it's still going to be there, but you need, to, you need to recognize that it doesn't belong in your life anymore. You need to, to recognize that it's dead. And, and then the Bible uses this word. It says that we need that the earthly things are lurking. Do you see that word, lurking? Do you, have you ever known anything good to lurk? Good things don't lurk, let me just tell you. Sneaky things lurk. Bad things lurk. And the Bible says that the things of this earth, the earthly things, they lurk. They, they hang out. They try to be made alive again in your life. Though we're supposed to consider them dead, they're around the corner constantly trying to have us pick them back up. They're trying to have us take Christ out of the chair and put ourselves back in them and then we get this list have nothing to do with sexual immorality impurity lust and evil desires I want to talk briefly about this this word sexual immorality and I'm about to get a really loud amen here I I can feel it coming here we go God is for sex amen amen I can talk about this a little bit more this service because my kids aren't sitting here. Um, 
Listen, sex is an incredible thing that, that God designed, right? It's something that he, he created and it was a gift and it's something that, that, it was, that there's, there's a beautiful use for it. But I want to also be really clear here. The official stance and the understanding of this church based on the, the leadership of this church and our understanding of the truth of, of Scripture is that sex was designed specifically within a very specific context. We believe that sex was designed to be enjoyed within a biblical marriage. And what I mean by a biblical marriage is one man and one woman married. And I I understand, listen, I understand I just made a lot of people in this room upset. You're thinking right now, Matt, when is the church going to catch up with the times? Matt, when... When finally are you going to realize that nobody does that anymore? Yeah, man and woman, I get that part maybe, but the whole marriage thing, that's so old-fashioned. Nobody does that anymore. Let me, let me give you my response. Not my response. Let me tell you the Bible's response to that, that way of thinking. Matthew 7, 13, 14 says, Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who enter through it. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life. And there are only a few who find it. Church, I want you to be very, very aware of this truth. God's way, the right way, is never, ever going to be the popular way. So if you're making life decisions and deciding what God wants for your life based on what everyone else is doing, That's a really, really bad measure. The Bible tells us again that these things are lurking within us, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, and evil desires. The truth is, uh, here's another example. You want another example of impurity and lust? The pornography industry is a $91 billion a year industry. To put that into perspective, that's more than all of the profit in the NFL, the NBA, Major League Baseball, NHL, all combined. Impurity and lust and evil desires are just growing and growing and increasing and increasing every day that we exist. So we need to be that much more ready to understand as a church that when we get ourselves out of the chair and we put Christ in it, that sometimes what Christ wants us to do and the views that we need to take and the way we need to live our lives might not be very popular but that Jesus is far better than the world. Here's, here's another reason, number four. We need to follow Jesus. This is my favorite one, because you are a lousy leader. <clears throat> At the end of the day, the, what this verse is about to show you and me, we are lousy leaders. When we put ourselves in a leadership role and we put ourselves in the director's chair and we start calling the shots, here's the truth. Do you know who you're thinking about when you're the one calling the shots in your life? You're thinking about you. You're thinking about yourself. And that's why this verse, when we read it together, it says, don't be greedy, for a greedy person is an idolater, worshiping the things of this world. You ought to stop for a second and say, why would the word greedy and idolater be used? Like, how is a greedy person also a world worshiper? That doesn't make any sense. Let me tell you why. Because when you are sitting in the director's chair, when you are the one, uh, like, making all the decisions, there's only one person that you really have in mind. You're thinking about you. When I sit in the director's chair of my life, I'm only thinking about me. I'm thinking about how can I make myself happier and better and get more. And then what we end up doing is we start taking advantage of people and things. We want to feel a certain way, so we abuse substances, We want to feel a certain way, and we're only thinking about ourselves, so we exploit other people. We create victims in our wake. We want to feel a certain way, so we we keep what God has given to us and say, you know what, all of this financial resource, I'm I'm going to keep it for myself. Because when you're sitting in the director's chair of your life, you're not thinking about anyone but yourself. And then the verse goes on to show us what happens when you're calling the shots in your own life and you're trying to get things to benefit you, do you know what happens when that doesn't work? When you're trying to satisfy yourself and it doesn't happen, here's a list in this verse. It says, 
But now is the time to get rid of anger, rage, malicious behavior, slander, and dirty language. Don't lie to each other, for you have stripped off your old sinful nature and all of its wicked deeds. See, the truth is that when we're calling the shots in our own lives and things don't go the way we want, that's when anger pops up, isn't it? That's when we start talking badly about other people, isn't it? That's when the dirty language comes out, am I right? That's when we start telling lies to, to somehow set ourselves back up for, for getting what we want. All of these things are a response to us being upset that we're not getting what the world had to offer. At the end of the day, it makes us a really lousy leader because when you're the one leading, you're only thinking about yourself. Would you want to follow a boss like that? Would you want to follow a boss that only had their own interest in mind? And yet, when we sit in the director's chairs of our lives, that's how we behave Let me say this again. When you are the one sitting in the chair, it makes you a lousy leader. It's a great reason to walk through this process of sanctification. Here's another reason we ought to close this gap. Another reason we ought to go through this process of sanctification. It says we ought to follow Jesus to become like him. This one is so important. In Colossians 3, 10 and 11, it says, put on your new nature and be renewed as you learn to know your creator and become like him. I'm gonna read that last part again. I want you guys to say it with me. Learn to know your creator and become like him. This part is so crucial in this process of sanctification. How can you ever hope to close the gap? Here's you and here's Christ. How can you ever hope to close in and to become more like Christ? unless you know Christ, right? You have to study him. You have to know who, who he loves and how he behaves and what he thinks and what, what he cares about and what he doesn't care about. And you have to understand the truth of who the, the, the creator is in order for you to become like him. So this verse says very clearly, you learn to know your creator and then become like him. One of the crazy things about sanctification, again, let me show you on this this spectrum of your life. If this is where you are right now, and this is where Christ wants you to be, and this process of getting closer and becoming more and more like him, everything on this side, everything that's happened yesterday and beyond, none of that really matters. In fact, who you were is irrelevant. The question is, who are you becoming? We don't want to worry about this this part that's gone. We want to start closing in on how can I become more like Christ from where I am right now? How can I be taking steps in my faith? And let me tell you, one of the clearest steps you need to be taking in your life, you need to be learning about your creator. You need to be spending time in his word. You need to be learning and studying who Jesus is so that you can become like him. You see, if your only understanding of who God is is what I tell you, if you're just coming on to church on a Sunday hoping that 35 minutes of Matt talking about the Bible is going to somehow help you take steps to, to becoming more like him, what if I tell you something that's not right? What if I tell you something that I understand to be true maybe or is not or even worse, I'm just a total liar and I'm telling you things I know not to be true? You see, in your own process of sanctification, you need to be learning who God is and taking steps towards becoming more like him because of that knowledge. Paul really struggled with this in his own life. He wrote in Romans 7, verse 15, I don't really understand myself, for I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. I think we have all experienced Paul's struggle over and over and over again in our lives. Because here's the the hard truth about sanctification. It's a really hard process. It is very hard. In fact, I want to read this quote to you. It says, people do not drift towards holiness. 
You are never going to go on, like get on this path and just say, I'm just gonna sit here and do nothing and hope the current takes me towards this process called sanctification and I become more and more like Christ. Instead, if you sit and do nothing, you are going to drift away. You're gonna drift towards compromise and call it tolerance. This process called sanctification is going to take work. It requires you to take specific action and to work towards becoming more like Christ. If you just sit and think, I'm just gonna show up to church on Sundays, sometimes maybe just once a month or twice a year, and hope that somehow I'm gonna be working on this process, that I'm gonna be becoming more and more like Christ, you're just lying to yourself. It's not gonna happen. You are drifting for sure. You are not drifting towards Christ. You see, this process of sanctification requires that we, we know who Christ is and then we, we wage war against our sin nature. We do whatever we can when it pops up in our lives to drop it and to consider it dead. Number six, I want you to follow Jesus because his path is good and right. Colossians 3, verses 12 through 15 says, since God chose you to be the holy people he loves. Let me stop right there. You know, when I was in middle school, when I was in elementary school, I had a nickname at recess time called Butterfingers. I was not athletic. Nobody wanted me on their team. At the, you know, when you're lining up against the wall and everyone's picking who they want to be on their, uh, their you know, two-hand touch football team, I was always the last one picked. I'm talking like after uh, everyone in line. And at, at some point you realize that you weren't the last one chosen, you were the last one, that they had to pick you because you were standing against the wall. And this whole concept of God choosing me, choosing you, that he, he, he picked you, he wanted you to be part of what he was doing, that ought to excite you. Since God chose you to be the holy people he loves, you must clothe yourselves with tender-hearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you remember the lord forgave you so you must forgive others above all clothe yourselves with love which binds us all together in perfect harmony and let the peace that comes from christ rule in your hearts for as members of one body you are called to live in peace and be thankful this process of clothing yourself, if you are like most people, this should be a daily process. Maybe uh, in college you could get away with doing this every other day or something. But listen, clothing yourself is something that we do every day. It's this process of getting up and purposely putting on what we're going to take into the world where, you know, on our bodies. And the Bible says that we ought to clothe ourselves and then gives us a list of the things that we ought to clothe ourselves on. You know, when my wife, uh, if, if we're trying to talk and I'm telling her about someone that I was talking to, but I forget their name, and I'll, I'll talk to her, I'll say, well, remember, they were, I was talking, they were kind of, they were this tall, or I'm trying to describe them a little bit. Her question to me in trying to figure out who I'm talking about is always this, what were they wearing? And my response every single time, uh, you would think she would have given up by now, is I have no idea what they're wearing. Like for whatever reason, when, I, when I'm having a conversation, er, tomorrow I will not remember what any single person in this room was wearing today. That doesn't store in my mind. You would have to be wearing like bunny ears or a clown nose for me to say, oh, the person in the clown nose, right? But the Bible says that we ought to clothe ourselves in these things to be so well known for our tender-hearted mercy and our kindness and our love and our forgiveness that when we put these things on and we go out into the world in this process of sanctification, as we become more like Christ, we're gonna be known by these things that people will recognize us and say, you remember that, oh, you mean that person who's always kind and forgiving? You know that woman at work? Oh, are you talking about the one who's just always just so full of love and peace and she's just always thankful? Are you talking about that guy who, who doesn't really matter what happens, he always just is full of joy? We want to wear 
these things with such uh, just extravagance that when people see us out in the world, they see something different and we are recognized by what we have on. And as we go through this process of sanctification, we understand that the way Jesus wants us to live is, is good and right. The real obvious thing that sometimes we miss about this list is that everything on this list, God did for us first. He showed us mercy. He showed us kindness and patience and humility and forgiveness. He caused us to have peace and thankfulness. He's thankful for you. And if we want to go through this process of sanctification, what it means is that we need to take steps towards being more like the God who did these things for us. So here's what I want to leave us with today. I want to give you something to walk away with. As we're thinking through this thing called sanctification, how can you take steps today to move towards Christ in your life? What steps do you need to agree to take right now in your life? What are, what's one particular thing that you need to take off and you need to consider it dead? Or what is something you need to pick up and you need to put on? Are you struggling with always being angry? Are you struggling with sexual immorality? Or is there something you gotta take off? I wanna encourage you today, especially as we have another opportunity to worship together, to think through what are the things from my old nature that I need to consider as good as dead and I need to take them off and drop them? And what are the things I need to pick up and I need to put on? Is it kindness? Is it tenderhearted mercy? Is it forgiveness? Is there someone that you need to forgive? Is it love? Is it thankfulness? Patience? What is it that you need to be wearing as you walk out of this place today? I'm gonna pray and then we're gonna have an opportunity to consider that request as we worship together. God, we love you and we thank you. You're so good to us we recognize that you belong in the director's chair and not us. So every day as we work through this process called sanctification, as we learn to become more and more like you, I pray that you remind us whenever we find ourselves sitting in your place, that you nudge us out of that seat and allow us to put you back into that place calling the shots in our lives. Allow us to consider dead the things from our old life and to put on these new things that you have for us that truly bring us joy. We love you and we thank you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together and worship.